Welcome everyone um, to uh, yet another meeting of the Jane Family Institute's Social Wealth Seminar, uh, which is an ongoing virtual forum exploring strategies to manage public assets and resources in service of a more just society in the US and across the world. Um, this is a project of the, of the Jane Family Institute. Um, JFI, for those who uh, don't know it, is an applied research organization in the social sciences based in New York City um, with a focus on digital ethics, higher education finance, and guaranteed income. Uh, and um, for those who don't know me, I'm Paul Katz. I'm Vice President of Special Projects at JFI. And in that capacity, I helped to organize um, the Social Wealth Seminar uh, along with some other projects. Um, so today, um, I am so excited um, to welcome a, a regular uh, participant and um, excellent questioner um, in, in the uh, Social Wealth Seminar Series, Steve Randy Waldman, uh, to actually take the floor today and, uh, and present himself. Uh, before I introduce Steve, though, um, just a couple um, quick preliminary words. Um, first, um, just to signal um, the two remaining sessions that we have programmed for this year. In two weeks on Tuesday, November 24th, we'll be hearing from Philip Rocco, who is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Marquette. And then two weeks after that, rounding out the year on Tuesday, December 8th, uh, we'll be uh, hearing from Sarah Quinn, who is Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Washington. Uh, I, I should also note very briefly um, that uh, in addition to uh, this seminar series and to regular events um, that we hold, um, you know, previously at our office, now on Zoom, um, JFI uh, runs a fantastic web publication called Phenomenal World, as well as a weekly newsletter. Um, so if you're not uh, checking out um, either of those, getting them in your inbox, um, I highly recommend them. Um, so uh, what do we have ahead for today? Um, we'll feature um, a, a 20 or 25 minute presentation from Steve. Uh, followed by lots of time for questions and discussion. Um, so please save your substantive questions for the end of the presentation. Um, though if you'd like to raise points of clarification, um, you can put them in the chat at any point and, and Steve may choose to address them uh, or not. Uh, I should also note that we're recording this session and we'll be posting a lightly edited version to our YouTube channel um, for those who weren't able to make it. Um, so if you don't want to appear incidentally, um, please um, be sure not to activate your video. Um, all right, um, so uh, just to close out these preliminary comments, um, uh, a couple of quick thanks, um, as always, to JFI's editorial department, and especially Hala Ahmad, our PR and policy communications lead, and Molly Dektar, our editorial director. Um, of course, to Steve for uh, joining us, and uh, to all of you for being present today. All right, um, so uh, with that all uh, out of the way, um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Steve Randy Waldman, who writes about finance, economics, and politics at interfluidity.com. Uh, so uh, with uh, all of this um, preliminary stuff uh, taken care of, uh, it is now my pleasure um, to pass the baton to you, Steve. Um, please take it away. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm gonna try to put up some slides. Let's see how that works out. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Here we go, I think I found them. And I think it works to put this in full screen. Okay, so can you guys see that? Yes, absolutely. So exciting. Okay. Um, all right, so perspectives on social wealth funds. Um, so prologue. So when Paul asked me if I'd participate, um, a, a little bit nonplussed because, um, um, you know, I'm unlike many of the other very um, distinguished speakers in the series, I'm not an original researcher. Um, nor am I um, engineering a social democratic revolution in a mid-sized American city. Um, so I'm, you know, I was trying to think what I had, what I might have to offer, and I thought um, probably the best that I could do is to try to synthesize some of the things that I've encountered here and elsewhere on this idea of sort of um, social wealth funds for social democracy. I guess one way of putting what that is is if whenever somebody uses the word social rather than sovereign. They're saying something about themselves. We used to call these things sovereign wealth funds, but now some of us call them social wealth funds. Um, so usual kind of caveats, nothing that I'm saying is really original except when it's horrible. Um, and I've done my best to bring in um, speakers from this series to make references to them. Um, although I missed some of the, I haven't, I haven't been to all of them. So if I omit you, um, please accept my apologies for that. Um, 
So the talk's going to be structured in three parts. Part one is tools, part two is tour, and part three is sort of my own take. So without further ado, um, er, just a few sort of ideas about thinking about social wealth funds that I, I find useful. And one is to divide whether or not the things that people are excited about with respect to these funds is the benefits and asset side, what you can do with all this money you're collecting or the things that you're buying. The financing and liability side, are you, um, is what's interesting that the state is buying, is spending money and that's supporting the economy, um, is the way that you're financing things affecting the broader economy in interesting ways. And then last but not least, actually quite the opposite is political economy. So I have this sort of, um, this seems like a natural ordering, but it, perhaps it should be reversed on the slide. I'm going to be less um, coy and just say, in my view, it should be reversed, <laughs> right? So people typically, when they talk about social wealth funds, start off by thinking about the assets and the benefits that they can fund. Um, I actually think the possibilities of social wealth funds, that political economy is first and foremost, that next most interesting and powerful is what you can do on the financing side and the benefits are kind of icing on the cake, but let's get into that. Some common purposes, again, for people who are talking about social wealth, wealth funds rather than sovereign wealth funds. Macro stability probably comes up the most. Social insurance of some form. Um, so obviously the most famous example of what you might call a social wealth fund in the US is the Social Security Trust Fund. That's a form of social insurance. Universal dividends can be thought of as a form of social insurance. Um, social democratic benefits in general. Um, industrial policy comes up a lot in conversations about um, social wealth funds. Um, a lot of us think that uh, unlike the sort of neoliberal consensus that states should stay out of the way of deciding what a country should do with its resources, markets should just decide that. Lots of us think that um, states should be more activist about thinking about what they want to do with their collective resources and kind of put a thumb on the scale of what markets do. Um, and social wealth funds are one way of doing that. Distributional justice, I think, is probably um, the most social of the social things that people talk about. A lot of people's excitement for social wealth funds is to somehow help us engineer a more egalitarian society. Um, and intergenerational justice, the notion of stewardship, of if a state manages assets, um, it should manage assets not just for the moment, but for a longer term. And maybe things like investment funds are good for that. Um, uh, a kind of less common um, distinction that has come up in previous talks that I think is worth emphasizing as a tool for thinking about these things is that when states um, operate social wealth funds, they're sometimes pretty differently constrained. Sometimes the real constraint is do they have the real resources um, that they're going to need to do something that they want to do and the purpose of the fund is basically to endow themselves with real resources. Um, other times that's not really a constraint and the constraints on what the funds are going to do have to do with the sort of distributional and political costs of issuing paper to put things in the funds. Um, so this uh, re relates a lot to the sort of MMT notion of monetary sovereignty, right? But for some states, um, some states can issue paper to do whatever they want to do in a social wealth fund and they're not gonna run into inflation or a flight from their currency those tend to be constrained by questions of distribution, sort of political questions surrounding, is it a good idea to issue paper and put things in the fund? Whereas for other states, certainly in a US context, um, states and municipalities in a global context, um, most states other than sort of a few states that really have a lot of financial flexibility face real resource constraints. They have to, they have a hard time, they can't just issue paper to buy whatever it is they might want to put in a social wealth fund without triggering inflation or some loss of confidence or a danger of default on their debt. Um, but some polities, United States, um, Great Britain, um, several of the Anglosphere countries, the EU as a whole, really don't have a real resource constraint in terms of how they're trying to structure something like a social wealth fund. The constraints have to do with, the, with political distributional um, questions. Okay. Part two, the tour. Um, so this is mix or match. All I've done is looked at this series and other things that I've read and encountered and looked for things it seems to me that people 
talk about things that they want to do with social wealth funds. And I've just tried to put a lot of them together um, and kind of tease them out as separate patterns that um, kind of policy entrepreneurs can pick and choose from and mix or match. Um, my including them here is not an endorsement. I'm excited about some of the ideas here, less excited about other of the ideas here. Um, in this section, I'm mostly just talking through them, although I, I'm sure I won't refrain from making some normative comments along the way. Um, but let's get started. Um, so a first and quite straightforward one is, um, I, I call it um, yeah, business cycle, macro stability, um, resource constrained. Um, so um, um, this is the idea that for a resource constrained polity, it's important to have some resources set aside for, for downsides of the business cycle. Um, so you collect investments in a sovereign wealth fund or a social wealth fund. And when the state needs to be active in the economy because the economy is suffering from a depression or recession, um, there are resources available. Whereas if you don't have such a fund and the state is resource constrained, often the state's hands are tied just when sort of Keynesian activity to counter the business cycle would be most useful and necessary. Um, so in this series, um, Marcelo Medeiros had a, a great talk on precisely this idea in a, in a Brazilian context. And um, most, for most polities, it is an idea worth thinking about, um, except perhaps the unconstrained ones, the, the polities that are capable of, of issuing paper without any near-term constraints. Um, what I find fun um, is, uh, um, you only notice how stupid your slides are when you are doing your talk. This is supposed to be business cycle macro stability too, um, distributional, distribution constrained. Um, what I find fun about these two slides, um, despite the poor titles, is that from a macro stability standpoint, there are really two quite kind of equal and opposite approaches. For the resource constrained states, it's about building the fund in good times and spending it down in bad times. For states like the United States or the EU as a whole or the Anglosphere states with their own currencies and a few others with their own currencies and with a lot of financial flexibility, um, the macro stability case is usually the opposite. Um, it's usually that in bad times, the state is going to spend money and it can just spend money. It doesn't have to have resources pent up in some kind of social wealth fund. It can just issue new paper. It doesn't face that fiscal resource constraint. Um, but um, typically, again, it's a political economy constraint. Typically when states do that in bad times, there's a very difficult political problem about your bailing people out. The state is spending money on things and it's gonna have winners and losers in terms of who it spends money on. And um, that leads to lots of questions about favoritism and corruption. Is this what was necessary to save the economy or is this what was necessary to save your cronies? Obviously, the, you know, the 2008 financial crisis, lots of us think that um, the response was both to a certain degree tailored to saving the economy, but in a way that was tilted, tilted to favoring certain clientels in the financial industry. Um, so one way of trying to address that um, is to, instead of spending money, um, invest it and make sure you get claims against as many as possible of the things that you're spending on. So you're bailing in rather than bailing out entities, you're buying claims against them. And if you're buying claims against them, if you're buying these kind of in investment assets, you need something to manage them. So a social wealth fund can do that. Um, so um, the emphasis is, is on the financing and liability side. It's not really about what you're gonna do with the stuff in the funds. It's about how you're getting the stuff in the funds to save the economy. Um, and um, the claims that you accumulate are kind of a byproduct. Um, and then you have to figure out what it is you want to do with those claims. So it's kind of fun in this mix or match thing. Some of the um, ways people want to use social wealth funds are about the financing, some are about the benefits, and you have to kind of put the two together if you want an actual proposal. Um, so if you're interested in, for example, trying to rescue the economy in a Keynesian way, but um, not just spending, but investing and taking claims, um, you have to think about what it is you want to do with the claims. What are you going to do with the assets that you accumulate? A big kind of normative issue that comes up in, um, in this um, idea or aspect of social wealth funds is um, whether or not 
the state that is issuing paper to buy up assets and effectively rescue um, entities in the economy. Um, should they support the prices of the paper, which is what sort of Roger Farmer famously argues that basically um, wealth effect, the business cycle is wealth effects is kind of Roger Farmer's um, take home lesson in one line. And so basically the state should support asset prices. So asset prices don't fall, there aren't adverse wealth effects and there's continued full employment. Um, or should a state try to be a vulture fund, try to ex exploit collapsing asset prices um, and try to get things on the cheap. Um, and there, there are good arguments in favor of both of those approaches, even from an egalitarian perspective. From an egalitarian perspective, the idea of becoming a vulture is very attractive, right? You can let the wealthiest class um, in your polity take big losses and at the same time acquire their assets and, and give them to the public. That does sort of a dual good. On the other hand, if the real economy collapses, that is good for no one. So I suspect the answer to this question of whether or not to support or exploit asset prices is going to be an interior solution rather than a corner solution of one or the other. Um, but I think it's something you should always think about when people make these proposals, how you want to manage that question. There is, from the perspective of a cynic like me, a real danger to the social wealth fund ideas that they become means of basically letting the rich get bought out at rich at generous prices. And on the one hand, yeah, you're acquiring assets egalitarianly for the public, but at the same time as you're doing that, you're just increasing the distance between kind of the cronies and the rest. Um, so I think it's a, a thing to be concerned about. Um, the Fed's current emergency SPVs are great examples of this. The Fed started buying up lots of corporate debt and a little bit of, mun of municipal debt at the beginning of this current COVID crisis, crisis. They still have a lot of it. There's a current controversy about whether or not that should continue. Um, oh, okay, let's see, next slide. Um, another kind of pair of things people wanna do with social wealth funds. Um, one is to manage balance of payments surpluses, right? So. Um, the issue here is what's usually referred to as kind of a resource curse. So sometimes countries have a balance of payment surplus that comes especially from um, oil wealth or some kind of resource. Um, and you've got a problem, you can get Dutch disease or a resource curse. That resource curse can take lots of, um, there, there are lots of aspects of it. The most common one is this problem of um, exporting the commodity um, um, creates a lot of wealth domestically, which creates inflation, which makes it difficult for the domestic economy to compete in an industrial sense um, with the rest of the world, which leads to a stagnation in kind of the productive economy in a society. There's also political economy problems with the resource curse, which is that resources are things that clientels within a country um, struggle to gain control of or gain the claims to. Um, and so you often have countries that end up with very corrupt political economies if they have um, a valuable natural resource um, because certain clientels manage to win control of the rents that derive from that resource. Um, so Rahul Basu's proposal was very much addressed towards, um, towards this, but the, the basic approach um, is very straightforward is that if you can get the state via a social wealth fund um, to instead of selling the resources and letting the income fall largely into private hands, if you can effectively have the resources under the stewardship of a social wealth fund that is well managed by the state on behalf of the public, um, to do that, maybe the resources simply become owned by the social wealth fund as a matter of law, if there are things like mineral resources, um, maybe there are heavy taxes and royalties um, on the sale of those if those resources are in private hands. Regardless, you siphon away a lot of the income so to reduce the inflationary expenditure. Um, and instead, instead of using those funds that you siphon off, um, or either don't, you either siphon them off or you don't, you can leave the resources in situ in, as property of the social wealth fund as well. Um, but to the degree that you have income because you've taxed or collected royalties, you absolutely don't spend those within the domestic economy because that would create your inflationary problem. 
um, you purchase a diversified portfolio of especially foreign assets um, so that you effectively are holding your own domestic economy harmless in terms of expenditure. So you don't have that inflationary burst of expenditure so that your industrial economy can remain competitive because you don't have a real inflation against the rest of the world um, because of this sort of unbalanced surplus. The most successful famous example of this is Norway, um, which has become wealthy by virtue of tremendous hydrocarbon wealth, um, but aggressively collected a lot of the rents from that into a social wealth fund, invested that in a diversified portfolio in the rest of the world, and has able to do very, very well despite the collapse in oil prices. The counter example is a Venezuela that tried to use its um, resource wealth, its hydrocarbon wealth in a way that would be egalitarian by simply uh, um, diverting the rents from its hydrocarbon economy towards um, support programs for the poor. And that worked very, very well for the period of time when oil prices were high um, and it collapsed catastrophically and has left a smoking husk of a failed state um, now that oil prices are low. Um, so there's, a, there's also a sort of justice or sustainability over time that Rahul Basu emphasized, that Rahul Basu emphasizes to this idea of um, taking the income that can be derived from a balance of payment surplus and putting it in a sustainable sovereign wealth fund um, or social wealth fund. The fun thing is, is that um, social wealth funds are very good also or have uses at managing a um, balance payments deficit, but it's quite different and it's only of use really for the, for the countries that don't have faced strong resource constraints. If you're if you're a country where you have a balanced payments deficit um, because you simply have no way of getting the resources that you need, this won't help so much. Um, but a balanced payments deficit tends to lead to um, a lot of bad things. Um, so fundamentally it's caused by, it's usually caused by, you are for some reason or another importing a lot more than you're exporting. Um, and so for one thing that means collectively you are becoming in debt to the rest of the world. And by having a social wealth fund um, issue claims um, into the, um, and buy stuff, excuse me, from the private, from the private sector um, in your own economy, you can replace the, you can shift the distribution of the liabilities that are being generated from balanced payments deficit, from private sector liabilities, which render your economy really fragile, to public sector liabilities, which in countries that are not resource constrained are more like equity, can bear a lot of risk, right? So in the United States, we have lots less to worry about the, the, from the fact that we have a lot of public sector debt than we would have to worry about if, if our banking systems debt or private sector entities were very heavily leveraged. And we saw this in 2008, where basically in a crisis, we effectively engineered a rotation of private sector indebtedness into public sector indebtedness um, via a lot of means fair and foul. Um, so thinking ahead towards how you wanna do this, the idea that basically states um, without strong fiscal constraints, but with um, balanced payments deficits, should maybe be in the habit of trying to reduce private sector indebtedness by spending into the economy. Um, and when they, they do that, maybe they should acquire claims um, on what they are spending into the economy to buy. Um, um, when they do that to buy those claims, this is an interesting one because I'm usually categorizing these little things as either an emphasis on the, on the asset side or the liability side. This is both. The rotating claims, rotating liabilities from the private sector into the public sector are about the liability side. Um, but you also want, if you have a balanced payment deficit, you have a drag on, ag on aggregate demand. So if you were managing a fund for this purpose, you would be thinking really hard about, okay, well, what are investment claims that we can buy in the economy that will promote real investment domestically, right? It's the opposite of what you want to do in the Norway case, where you're trying to buy foreign assets um, to to keep pulling back on domestic demand because you're trying to counter inflation. Here, you have a disinflationary problem because um, 
because demand is basically being sucked away from your economy um, by imports. So you want to think about domestic real investment that you can do that will engender some domestic demand. You also, this stuff is controversial, more controversial, but I think more interesting and important. You want to direct investment in a matter supportive of a desired industrial policy, if you think industrial policy is a good idea, which a lot of us do now, right? So this is an opportunity for a state, if you think there should be an industrial policy, to convert what looks like this weakness, this balanced payments deficit, this reliance on the economy um, of imports rather than domestic industrial goods or domestic production, convert that into a trick that you can use to support the in, sort of industrial policy of the future, what it is, the direction that you think you want to shift the economy into. Also, I think really importantly, and also a bit controversially, um, smart countries strive to retain an autarky option, right? Autarky is, autarky is a, a bad word among economists. If you don't know what it means, autarky, autarky basically means a no trade world, right? A country that tries to go on its own and avoid foreign trade. It's the, the perfect opposite of free trade is autarky. The country just tries to be self-sufficient. And the usual economics case is that specialization in trade is the source of human wealth. Um, and autarky is a stupid idea that should be avoided. It's, you know, more regressive than even typical um, politically corrupt protectionism. Um, and I mostly agree with that case, by the way. But there's a difference between wanting a thing and wanting an option of a thing. Um, and an autarky option is tremendously valuable for a country because if you can afford not to import stuff, not to trade, if necessary, you have control over the terms of trade, you have leverage. If you can't, then you become like a lot of countries in the global south at the mercy of your trading partners. If you absolutely rely on real imports, from the rest of the world, um, whatever happens in the rest of the world and the rest of the world in a capitalist world is, is conspiring against you, is trying to get terms of trade to benefit them and not you, um, you are gonna have to take what you can get and you're gonna find yourself in deep debt and crises and, and under the tender mercies of the IMF and all that kind of stuff, right? So I think um, countries should strive very, very hard to retain an autarky option, not to go for autarky, but to always have the credible ability to say no to trade um, so that they have some leverage over the terms of trade. This kind of sovereign or social wealth fund is really good for that um, because even when your industrial capacity is being sapped away by free trade competitors, think the China shock in the United States, right? For a variety of reasons under the kind of globalism that we've pursued, lots of industries were simply not competitive with China under the terms that we perhaps rightly, perhaps wrongly, were willing to accept with China. Um, what we could and should have done is used our sovereign to maintain a certain seed corn level of industrial capacity in all of the industries we were letting decline domestically, right? Um, and so since an unconstrained balance of payments deficit country is basically trying to spend money into the economy to counter the um, aggregate demand loss, it can do things like basically have the sovereign invest in not-for-profit industrial enterprises that are about sort of research and maintenance of industrial capacity in industries that are increasingly shifting to somewhere else, but in a way that you maintain a capacity where you could quickly scale up if the terms of trade ever were to shift and you retain your autarky option. Um, it doesn't matter that those investments might be loss-making. That's fine if you're not subject to fiscal constraints too badly. Um, so this is, I think, a really important one that's not very much explored. Um, this is another one of my favorites, capital tax machine. This is, this is sort of hardcore egalitarian, um, some would say socialist. Um, one really interesting thing about um, social wealth funds that I think is underappreciated, a lot of people are interested in them for egalitarian reasons. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of times it comes up you know, why, what is it that a social wealth fund can do that you couldn't do just by, just by taxing, right? So if, if, you're, if, if you're trying to, say, use the financing side of a social wealth fund um, to equalize things by, say, taxing capital to fund your fund, um, why not just have the capital tax and let it go to general revenue? What's the point of the social wealth fund? And I think a point that people don't really get 
is that a social wealth fund can out capitalist all of the private sector capitalists. Um, because whoever you are as a private sector capitalist, even if you're Jeff Bezos, some fraction of your earnings, if you're Jeff Bezos, it's a very small fraction, unfortunately, but some fraction of your earnings of your returns has to be spent. You have to live, you have to maintain your life. It's not all being reinvested into capital investment. If you have a really a hardcore financing side um, social wealth fund, you can simply tax capital income or wealth um, and you can be an, an aggressive return seeking investor within the public sector. And the point that a lot of people don't realize is that the compound returns on your investor, on your investments, if you are buying up private sector assets and letting it compound, and if you are not spending from the income or spending less than, than the private sector as a whole is in aggregate, then you are going to increase the share of the private, of private sector capital that you own in the same way kind of a Marxist analysis says that, that the, the best accumulators of capital come to dominate a, ca a capitalist economy, right? You basically let your social wealth fund be that capitalist with an unusual advantage. And over time, capital will accumulate in a very dystopian Marxist way, but instead of accumulating in the hands of some big time industrialist, it will accumulate in the hand of this social wealth fund. Um, and then once you have this, once you have owned the means of, you've come to own a large fraction of the means of production by very capitalist means, um, you can start to do the kinds of things socialists or social democrats want to do with some degree of control over the means of production. Um, so you can come to, you can exercise control risk, control rights as a capitalist, as a shareholder. So, um, and that can substitute for things that are much more controversial, right? It's controversial to try to control private firms by regulating them. Um, and it's also, aside from controversial, it's very, um, it, it's, it's coarse grain. You have to come up with these regulations and then they stay in effect and conditions change and you can't change behavior very fast. Whereas if you simply have people representing other stakeholders, the public or important stakeholders like labor on the board of, the, of these firms, then you can get the benefits of regulation or public sector control in a much less politically contentious and more informationally adept um, way than conventional regulation. Um, you can also address some of the growing concerns about industrial concentration and antitrust um, because your sovereign wealth fund almost naturally, if you are return aggressive, it will be seeking to buy firms with monopoly power, right? If you're, if you're taking the role of the kind of kind, uh, villainous industrial capitalist in, in a cartoon Marxist scenario, if you're Warren Buffett, for example, um, then you are looking for firms with moats to buy shares of because those are the return generating firms. So you'll naturally acquire these monopolies. And once you get control over those monopolies, well, you can unmonopoly them a little bit, right? You can start to operate them in ways that benefit the public rather than accumulate rents, um, excuse me, um, to shareholders who are largely you now. So there's, a, there's a, an antitrust element built into this capital tax machine story. So this is, I think, a sort of underrated story. Um, stewardship for public resources. Um, this is a perspective that I think comes up a lot. Um, Rahul Basu's in this series was a, a wonderful example, um, but it's a really important thing, right? We, um, as, um, as Rahul and Scott Pegg go in great depth in their paper about, we often frame resources as though they were windfalls or transient income. GDP is gross domestic project, product, and that's how we evaluate how the economy is doing, which means we ignore the depreciation, we ignore the, the cost over time to how we're exploiting resources. Um, we know we're burning out the planet. Um, so we know that uh, investment funds, to some degree, do a good job. In fact, it's, it's often their role to spread out the benefits of resources over time. Um, so if states would take resources that are broadly public, whether they start out broadly public or whether we do some kind of financing to make them broadly public um, and put them into 
a social wealth fund whose mandate is to make sure that the benefits of those resources are perpetual, not burned through over some shorter period of time, we might be able to get a lot better resource, man resource management in terms of intergenerational equity or equity over time. Um, okay, dedicated endowments for specific use. This is a really common one, and the Social Security Trust Fund in the US is a very obvious example. Um, we also have in the US, at least lots of universities have capital investment trusts. We sometimes talk about, you know, kind of endowing an infra infrastructure trust or fund. Um, so we think about the benefit. We think about we want to commit to doing some good thing and we're going to generate a fund to finance that. I just want to say about this, that there's sort of a good and a bad angel with this idea. It's a very popular idea. The good angel is that you put a lot of funds in your capital investment trust or your social security trust fund or whatever, and it represents a commitment that might be hard to undo, right? It's why, um, why you know, FDR famously was fond of having a dedicated tax and a dedicated trust fund. The idea is that basically the, the trust fund already owns the funds for a particular purpose, so that they couldn't be redirected politically. There's a commitment to doing this thing, to paying out Social Security. So hurrah, there's a pre-commitment, but it's also really important that this way of structuring things might be counterproductive to the resources that you are, to the purpose that you are excited about endowing because it represents a vulnerability. If the purpose is endowed from the fund, then it becomes extremely vulnerable politically if there's a time when the funds can't meet the, perf meet the purpose. Those who oppose the purpose will basically say, well, clearly this thing has been mismanaged. Clearly this is socialist pie in the sky. And that's why the trust fund is bankrupt, right? So we have this politics in the United States, it's a bit ridiculous because the United States can afford to pay social security in perpetuity at its current or increasing levels without any kind of problem. Um, but we have this trust fund, which is politically very important. And Republicans are the ones always um, suggesting payroll tax holidays from it um, because a, it's, it's, it's genuinely good in the short term. It's egalitarian. It puts money in people's pockets today. Um, and B, in the long term, it makes very vulnerable a thing that they oppose, um, this long-term bit of social democracy that we have in the United States. Um, so I think we have to be really cautious. It's very exciting to say, aha, we've, we've, we now have endowed in perpetuity this exciting thing, this good thing, this, this, this public benefit. Um, but you've also created a, a vulnerability if you've shrouded it in a social wealth fund. Um, so um, this is a subclass of that, a specialization. It's very popular. Again, Rahul Basu in this series and Matt Brunig um, in his, with his universal basic dividend. Yaakov, I, I, I should say this, uh, almost all of these things um, Yaakov and, and Nils Gilman have proposed. I, I have these perspectives. It's like a mix or match, mishmash. You should just like choose maybe two of them for your proposal. Their national endowment is basically all of these um, in, in one giant thing. Um, but you know, the idea, the, the simple idea is you're going to have a social wealth fund and um, you're looking for egalitarianism, not so much in the financing. You're not talking about that you're going to tax the rich to fill the fund or buy up assets on the cheap to fill the fund. That's kind of egalitarianism on the financing side. But on the asset and benefit side, you can have egalitarianism by using the fund to say fund a universal dividend like Alaska does in its permanent fund. Um, or you can use it to finance more conventional um, social democratic benefits. Um, you can, you know, um, to finance housing guarantees or um, schools or whatever universal social benefits that you want to finance. You can, you can set up a fund for your universalistic social benefit state. Um, and that's a great idea in some sense, but there's this caveat from the previous slide, which is that it's a pre-commitment to doing whatever egalitarian thing that you're doing, but it's also a vulnerability, meaning as the, if the vicissitudes of the investment environment and the financing environment mean that the funding in your fund begins to dry up, then your egalitarian programs um, become very vulnerable. Um, so I think there's a real question as to whether or not the benefit of the pre-commitment outweighs the vulnerability, um, unless there's also an outside political commitment to basically guarantee the benefits. Um, there's also the hazard that we talked about before that, um, you got to be careful that you're not financing things in a way that is adding to inequality. So I'm pretty opposed to the idea of 
uh, you know, having the government just um, just um, issue debt to purchase private sector securities to finance a universal dividend. Um, yeah, that's great. There'll be a universal dividend, but you're bidding up the prices of the assets that you're buying. You're paying, you're increasing the distance between plutocrats and the rest in order to get this egalitarian benefit. If you want to do it, I think you got to be really, really careful on the financing side so that you're buying assets cheaply, aggressively, whether you're doing it as a vulture or you're doing it out of capital taxation. So basically the bid that you're putting into the asset markets is countered by the draw that you're taking because capital taxes, whether they're income taxes or wealth taxes, you're, you're taking um, wealth that otherwise would be a bid in the asset markets that you're participating in. You don't want, you're not, you're short circuiting your, egalitar your egalitarian benefits if you're adding an incremental bid into assets and raising their prices before you buy them. Um, Source of entrepreneurial and, or municipal finance. This one comes up a lot and it's also very similar to public banking proposals, right? Right now, private banks decide what it is gets funded, what it is doesn't. Private banks and venture capitalists and um, other sources of private finance. That's got a big problem, right? That leaving everything to private finance um, means that it's extremely difficult to incorporate externalities, positive externalities into our investment decision making. There's some kind of investments that are financially riskier relative to the return we expect from them than a private sector actor would accept, but that might be socially valuable despite that because they have positive, positive externalities. Um, so if we're going towards an industrial policy, investment that is consistent with that industrial policy has from a certain sense positive externalities and we might want to be able to accept more risk than a private sector um, investor or lower returns. Um, and a social wealth fund can do that because its mandate is not strictly, need not strictly be return maximizing or risk minimizing or kind of sharp ratio maximizing. Um, so, um, so we might be able to get a much higher quality of investment if we have investors that are capable of basically internalizing um, externalities, positive externalities into their investment decisions. Um, I think this is a great idea, although it's always hard to think about, um, you know, how you're going to, how you're going to rank those externalities, right? The hazard obviously is that rather than um, taking sort of below market investment prospects because they're socially valuable externalities, you take below market investment prospects because there are cronies to the managers of the fund. Um, so management, managing this kind of thing well is hard, but it's an interesting and important um, proposal. Okay, um, last part, I don't even know how much time there is, so I'm gonna try to hurry up, usually I'm slow. Um, my own kind of take on things. Um, the reason why social wealth funds are important and interesting is all about political economy, all about political economy. First, anything a sovereign wealth fund can do or a social wealth fund could do, a state could do directly, right? You don't need this sort of artificial quasi-public, quasi-private entity sitting between the public and the private sector. The state can buy securities if it wants to buy securities. It can buy assets if it wants to buy them. Even if it's not directly, the state's not directly buying up assets, it can often simulate the kinds of things that you're trying to do, right? If what you're trying to do is, is egalitarian on the financial side, well, you can just do that with capital taxes. Um, if what you're doing um, is, you know, you're trying to do egalitarian benefits, you can just fund them from general revenue, right? So the reason that you do a social wealth fund is because you think creating this kind of quasi-private public entity um, is going to give you some kind of political economy advantages over synthesizing the same results yourself in a different way. Um, uh, so part of that is it might just be easier for the, for the social wealth fund to do things that you would like it to do because otherwise you'd have to do lots of things by legislation, which is hard or things like that. Um, and sometimes you're just trying to kind of skew the future. You're trying to get a kind of pre-commitment. Once the social wealth fund exists, it'll be politically difficult to undo something like the social security trust fund. Um, 
So in a neoliberal context, a lot of the political economy advantage is that this quasi private corporate thing naturalizes a lot of things that would be considered politically contentious as state action. Right. So we talked about this before. If you're trying to, you know, control an enterprise by regulation that involves legislation and procedural crap at agencies. If you are just a manager of a social wealth fund voting your shares, that's capitalism doing its usual thing. In a neoliberal context that flies under the radar, that's natural behavior. Shareholders are allowed to define and exercise their interests however they want, rather than the evil public sector clumsily regulating or whatever. Um, and in substantive terms, besides political terms, that kind of quasi-regulation might actually be better, right? Regulation is hard and slow. Legislation is even harder and slower to do well. Whereas if you have an agency managing private re sector resources just as a fund, but they vote their shares and they have representation on their board, they can consider the public interest in a very continuous and contingent way, not with the kind of lag and clumsiness of regulation and legislation, and vote their shares appropriately or create incentives for the CEOs of the organizations, for the management of the organizations that they own in a continuous way um, that are in the public interest. Um, so I think that we talked through a lot of these in the, in the last one, naturalizing public ownership um, in a neoliberal context. The fund just owns shares. It doesn't look like the state, you know, you know, the state doesn't have to revise the economy so that there aren't private sector enterprises. It's just the state owns part of some of them, like Norway. Um, Naturalizes co-determination. If you want workers to control the fund, well, you can, you know, you can vote for them on the board. If the state owns the shares, whatever stakeholders you want represented on the board, you own a significant fraction of the board. Put them there. Um, naturalizes regulation. What we were talking about, instead of regulating, you can have your board members control the fund, exercise, impose pressure on management so that enterprises are managed in the public interest without the requirement of or with reduced requirement for external regulation. Um, an important thing I think about this naturalization is that you can have degrees of public ownership. Instead of talking about, oh, we're socialists, own the means of production, or oh, we're capitalists, you know, decentralized everything. I think it's much more productive to think about where we really need a lot of kind of public control of capital resources and where we don't. Um, and so if you ask me about that, I'll say things like, Enterprises that are large and monopolistic should largely be in the hands of the public, right? We can't rely on, on sort of libertarian stories of competition to regulate those things in some facsimile of the public interest. But entrepreneurial and small firms, you know, um, a lot of those can be left private. And the nice thing about social wealth fund proposals is this kind of thing would naturally be the case, right? If, if you have some kind of social wealth fund buying up shares of firms are going to buy the big public firms first unless you make a specific effort you know to try to buy out the mom and pop restaurant or whatever um so um but the important thing is that we can think about this as a matter of policy how much and what kinds of capital should be subject to substantial public control and how much and what kind of capital should be left to free enterprise um, those are important questions, and we can answer them anywhere along a continuum in terms of the quantity of share and in any qualitative direction in terms of what it is that we want social wealth funds to purchase versus what it is we want them to, to leave largely in the private sector. Maybe we want to subsidize in ways that don't result in public control. Um, I think an under-discussed thing is the political economy of taxation. Um, We've talked about this with respect to the capital taxation machine, the idea of accumulating compound returns within a sovereign wealth fund is basically a workaround of otherwise politically contentious taxation that would cause a lot of distortion in the economy in neoliberal terms as people try to avoid the taxes. People try to avoid taxes, but they don't try to avoid firms issuing returns to their shareholders, um, which replaces capital taxes if you have an aggressive return seeking social wealth fund. Um, a thing that I think is under discussed is that in a world of social wealth funds, um, you can do a lot of wealth and capital taxation in kind. 
So a lot of the problems with wealth taxation that come with, oh, well, you're gonna force the family to liquidate the farm in order to pay the 2% that they own as a wealth tax. Well, no, that's stupid, right? We should develop means whereby if there's, you know, if you gotta pay 2% of the farm as a wealth tax, um, then you pay a 2% share of the farm and the state owns 2% of, of the 2% of the farm. And obviously there's sort of um, corporate legal issues about protecting minority stakeholders and things like that, that have to be worked out. Um, but I think a big advantage of potential social wealth funds is this ability to tax in kind. Um, lots and lots of um, disingenuous objections to various forms of capital taxation go away if you can just take the tax in kind. Um, so those are a lot of good things about the political economy of social wealth funds, but there's bad things too, right? There's the issue, can social wealth funds be captured by self-dealing private actors? I think we should be really concerned about that. BlackRock is administering the current emergency, effectively social wealth funds that the Fed has um, endowed this time around for the COVID crisis. Um, I don't trust them, do you? Um, um, in general, a lot of the conversation around social wealth funds, national endowments, whatever, assumes that the problem of managing these funds in the public interest is solved or solvable. But people who object to them will argue, and I think these arguments need to be taken seriously and addressed, that actually we don't know how to do that, that actually it will always end up look like BlackRock um, managing these tremendous funds and, and diverting rents to themselves and to certain clientele and cronies. Um, I think that's a, you know, social wealth fund enthusiasts really have to work on addressing that question. To be fair, a lot of them have, right? I mean, this, my summary is not, my synthesis is missing lots of stuff and there are lots and lots of conversations about um, how, okay, we shouldn't have one social wealth fund, but we should have competing social wealth funds so that we, we generate a kind of quasi private sector competition for returns and stewardship within them. Lots of ideas, ways of addressing this question. I don't think it's fatal by any sense, but it's an important question to address. Um, there's Mike Consul's objection to, um, to social dividend proposals, um, which is to say if you turn the public into shareholders in such an explicit way, where basically they're getting a dividend that is contingent on the value of the shares or the return of their shares, is that going to uh, create a kind of capitalist class consciousness among the general public where they think that their interests are served by maximizing the value of their shares when maximizing the value of their shares means subverting valuable regulation or encouraging industry concentration so more rents go to profits so because things like um, regulatory the costs of insufficient regulation or the costs of insufficient competition are kind of tacit and submerged. And if you're not careful, the benefits of a universal dividend are sort of gamified. Citizens can see it. There's a real hazard that it'll be a kind of, you know, social democratic own goal um, that you'll end up with a public that thinks of itself as little capitalists and is busy supporting a dystopian monopoly deregulated economy, suffering from it but hoping their way out is a bigger universal dividend and, and continuing to support it. You know, again, I don't think that's a fatal concern, but I think it's a real concern to address in trying to design these things. Um, um, the question we talked about too, do financing universal benefits from social wealth funds, does that render the benefits vulnerable in a way that, you know, Republicans are always like being generous with their, payroll tax holiday proposals because they're trying to kill the trust funds, right? That's a real, you know, we think that the political economy of this thing is, aha, if we have a social wealth fund, the political economy is we're permanently pre-committing to a good thing. Yeah, but you're also, if you're not careful, you're creating a permanent vulnerability. Um, so, you know, I think basically if you're gonna finance benefits from a social wealth fund, you should, you should guarantee those benefits with the full faith and credit of the government. A good example of that is FDIC, right? FDIC collects insurance premium from banks um, and it uses that to finance um, its deposit guarantees. Um, in theory, that fund has never been broken, but only because of a lot of chicanery during the 2008 crisis to bring a lot of revenues forward. Um, but the FDIC's deposit guarantee is itself 
guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the government, right? So there's no risk um, for um, deposit insurance um, that deposit insurance would be undermined by the FDIC, by FDIC's funds being depleted by the premiums collected and invested being depleted, even if that happens, um, the full faith and credit of the state guarantees the benefit, guarantees the deposit insurance. I think if we're financing um, social democratic universal benefits from social welfare funds, we need to insist upon that full faith and credit guarantee. Otherwise, we're creating a real vulnerability as well as a pre-commitment. Um, sort of to sum it up, Perversity critiques, rhetoric of reaction, they always are rhetoric of reaction, um, but they should be taken seriously and addressed because some of them are, however disingenuously or not presented, some of them are real issues. Um, I think I've already done all of this, but um, um, so core social benefits should be defined and committed to in politically independent of financing vehicles. That's that guarantee idea. Um, supplemental benefits like the Alaska Permanent Fund where you can afford for them to vary with financial conditions in the fund, those can be funded as dividends. But you know, I don't think, I think there's a difference between say a UBI that you expect people to rely upon and a universal dividend that could be very variable. I think those are just sort of different things. Um, um, and then a lot of the virtues of social welfare funds sort of counterintuitively are about how they're financed um, rather than the benefit side and benefits are often sort of justifying the financing rather than the other way around. Um, and with that, I think that was it. And I'm sorry if I've gone long, I usually do. I have, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for putting up with me. Oh, to the contrary, my goodness. Um, thank you so much, uh, Steve, for, for this um, remarkable presentation. I mean, you, you may describe it as, as just synthesis, but I, I think that's kind of a, an abuse of the adverb. Um, I, I found this to be personally extraordinarily helpful um, and um, really um, provocative, um, especially in the in the in the shift away from benefits, um, which I, I just uh, found to be extraordinarily helpful. Um, so we're, we're actually a little bit after seven, um, but based on who is here, I I suspect that people will have questions or, or points that they want to engage in discussion. So I wonder, I mean, if it's if it's all right, maybe we can just take a, a few extra minutes. Um, Steve, would that be okay? And, and um... Yeah, it's, it's fine with me. I apologize to all of you for either cutting your question times short or making the time long. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, again, I, I uh, found this to be, um, you know, just extraordinarily helpful. Um, and uh, I mean, of course, no, no surprise for, for readers of, uh, of Interfluidity, but uh, certain, certainly wouldn't want, have wanted to, uh, to abbreviate it. Um, but I, I do want to make sure that um, those who, you know, would like um, have the chance to um, raise questions or points. Um, so if, if um, you have one in mind, um, please just um, let me know in the chat. Um, and I can, you know, call on you, and you can, you know, activate your video and introduce yourself. Um, alternatively, if you prefer not to appear on the camera, you can type your question into the chat, and I'll read it for you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the the floor is open. Um, those who would like to um, ask questions or or, or comment um, in the in the group chat, um, go ahead and and, and signal. Um, and uh, you know, perhaps as we um, give people a moment to to collect their thoughts, um, you know, I, I always have have some questions. Um, and I, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and ask one of them, um, which is, um, do, do you think on, on, on some level um, there, uh, sovereign wealth funds are, are inherently anti-democratic? Um, is there, you know, a, I mean, of course, you know, we can think about, you know, many models for governance, but, you know, I think fundamentally a big part of the appeal, uh, at least in the United States, is kind of the sense of oh, the legislative process is broken. You know, we have no capacity to achieve anything via fiscal policy, and this kind of uh, emerges sort of technocratic white knights. Um, do, do you think is that is that is that uh, is that inherent to the uh, the nature of the of the project? I I don't think that it is, but I think it's it's very institutionally de dependent. So I think it's it's a real thing to to worry about. The governance is incredibly important. It's kind of everything. Um, and I do think in large part, some of the enthusiasm for social wealth funds is a function of how dysfunctional we consider the legislature to be. But even in a kind of maximally functional legislature, um, legislatures are just never, I never say never, you know, maybe we get utopian, but for a long time, legislatures are not going to be capable of basically 
governance at a kind of executive frequency and sensitivity to information. And so in the, in the corporate sector, right, we have this continuum. We start with shareholders. Their firms should be democratically run, you know, in the interest of shareholders, but we recognize shareholders in a public firm are too unwieldy a body for management. And so we winnow. We go from shareholders to a board to management. Um, and so I don't think there's anything anti-democratic about that kind of winnowing of a broad, less frequently informed, less generally informed, more expensive, more costly to intervene group of stakeholders delegating to a narrower group of stakeholders um, to govern in a more informed and sensitive way. But I do think there's tremendous, tremendous, tremendous risk that it becomes in practice anti-democratic. Um, you know, that, that basically the governance of these resources get captured by clientele. So, um, you know, regulatory capture is a tremendous problem in our current society. And if we had more discretionary social wealth funds than we do, social security trust fund just invests in government securities, so it's not an issue. But if we did have more discretionary social wealth funds, they would immediately become targets for capture and control. And whether or not we're capable of, um, of addressing that, of protecting that institutionally, um, I don't know. I think you know, we should talk about it in terms of how and then evaluate those proposals rather than prejudging um, whether we can do it. Yeah, I think that makes a, a tremendous amount of sense. Um, well, I, I, um, I see that um, Alec has, um, has raised a question or, or a pair of them. Um, Alec, would you like to, um, to, to ask them? Sure. Um, hi, Steve. Thanks for a really great, great talk. Um, I had two unrelated questions. The first was, I was wondering if you could say a bit about um, what the structural challenges you see that might face sovereign wealth funds at much for smaller sovereigns, so for states or cities, um, potentially involving schemes that might include mechanisms like complementary currencies and so on. Um, and then the other unrelated question was, uh, of the little I know about government-sponsored enterprises, um, like Sally May once upon a time, it seems like those tend towards mechanisms like servicing debt rather than investing in equity, which if I'm understanding correctly, could lead it to look more like a sovereign wealth fund. And I'm wondering, um, A, I guess, whether that's the case and B, if so, what the kind of structural reasons for that have been historically. Yeah, those are, those are great questions. So to the first question, I think smaller social wealth funds, um, they obviously have a role in terms of the, the resource constrained rainy day fund version, right? And, right? and they exist and lots of states and municipalities have funds set aside um, in that way. The interesting question that you raise when you talk about complementing currencies, et cetera, is would it be possible to give um, less sort of hegemonic sovereigns than a few nation states or supranational <laughs> entities the fiscal space, the fiscal capacity um, to do some of these other things that depend on not being so resource constrained with complementary currencies. Right. And, you know, my answer to that is I think they should try. I think we should be experimenting a lot more. I think it is kind of a sin in the corporate world. Im imagine in the corporate world, if, if, if only a very small fraction, if only 2% of firms were allowed to issue equity and everything else had to be perfectly debt financed. Right. Right? Imagine how fragile that would make a lot of businesses and how dominant that would make the few that have equity finance available. But that's fundamentally what we've done in the public sector world. Um, currency issuers um, in countries that are in sort of MMT terms, monetarily sovereign to a high degree. And we always have to talk about degree and we have to talk about a lot of preconditions for that fiscal space. Um, but these, some of these currency issuers are capable of issuing a kind of equity, a security that looks a lot more like equity than debt, um, and supporting their value um, among the broad public. Um, and part of that has to do with these tremendous advantages, things that simply come from being a sovereign. But we know from the private sector that private sector firms also issue equity that has no fundamental value, right? Penny par value or no par value stock, right? No particular assets behind it. but firms are actually pretty good at finding ways to support the value of their resources, despite not taking on the, the risk of any explicit guarantee. 
and I think we want to endow subnational municipal entities um, with the ability to experiment with those kinds of claims and a lot of potential, a lot of the sort of more speculative ideas with social wealth funds might become available to a wide variety of public sectors um, if they can issue those kinds of currencies. So the speculative things they do, fundamentally the issue is, is that if you're doing something speculative or unusual or you're buying equity stakes in things because it's local industrial policy or something like that, there's always the possibility that it doesn't work out and you want the risk of that to be shared with, the finance, with, with those who buy claims in the stake rather than to become this very brittle, oh my God, the city is bankrupt kind of risk. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about um, using complementary municipal currencies, some form of municipal equity so that um, municipalities and states can experiment with kind of venture finance, local industrial policy, lots of ideas. And the people who are holding the currencies, eyes open, understand they're not holding dollars, right? They're holding right. something speculative, but they might be being used as, as, if they're used as complementary currencies, that gives localities lots of interesting ways to help support their value locally. Um, right. So, you know, the kinds of things that firms do a share buybacks, um, municipalities can do with local tax acceptance or use in local transactions mm -hmm. in a tax favored way. Um, so I think it's a really important and interesting idea and we should be doing a lot of experiments. And the great thing about small scale things is you can do them as experiments. Whereas right. with these national ideas, all of a sudden you're committing trillions. Um, the, I think the, the stuff about Sally May and the agencies buying debt, I think that's in the United States, we have had no, we've had a, a political consensus that says that the state should not be involved in markets in the way that most of these ideas presuppose it, right? If we're, if we're buying equity stakes to support industrial policy or to exercise control over entities, basically the neoliberal consensus has said it's out of bounds for states. It's gonna kill the private sector, bad for the economy. Um, so that historically is why we've done it. And also a better, you know, that's sort of a bad reason from a, at least a contemporary left perspective, uh, a good reason why they've tended to buy only relatively simple debt securities um, is that they're much easier to value and they're safer than equity securities, right? They're trying to buy things that are relatively senior or if it's prime mortgages or buying things that are very well collateralized. Um, so those two things, the consensus that we didn't want to do the things we now think about wanting to do with social wealth funds and a consensus that we wanted safety um, has made these things historically very vanilla, except in crises, right? In crises, all of a sudden, you know, from the Great Depression um, with its reconstruction funds to, to uh, you know, the 2008 crisis to now with all the you know, SPVs of the Fed, in a crisis, all of a sudden, we're buying up everything and we're manip manipulating things. Although still in the 2008 crisis, right, the Treasury had to invent um, equity securities in city that would, that, that, that would have no control rights. Right, they, they worked hard to financially engineer away from the control rights that they should have had because those leaders um, were believers in that traditional neoliberal consensus that public sector control over commercial organizations is the kiss of death, is bad. Right. Um, so, you know, the fact that that consensus is changing, changing um, and uh, 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 an open-eyed willingness to tolerate the risks associated um, with buying more speculative securities, risks of loss of value and risks of, of corruption, of, of buying things stupidly or badly, not in the public interest. Um, you know, if we're willing to accept those risks and if we are no longer sure that industrial policy is bad or the public interest making its influence known in capitalism is bad, um, then maybe we'll do different things. That's really helpful. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you, um, Alec, and, and and thank you, Steve, um, for for this really um, spectacular presentation and exchange. Um, uh, perhaps now would be uh, a, a good time for us to um, to to wind down for the evening. Uh, though I, I, I will say I have I've been left with so much to think about, um, and I'm, I'm kind of thrilled that we've ended on this this note of possibility. Um, you know, kind of for um, uh, subnational entities uh, as, as well. Um, is that obviously something that we have been um, thinking a lot and, 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 and working um, on at, at JFI. 
Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, in fact, uh, I, I, I do want to close um, by thanking you, uh, Steve, not not simply for um, this uh, extremely comprehensive um, and and um, uh, synthetic in the in the best possible way um, presentation, uh, but also uh, for the uh, really kind and, and generous incorporation of so many of the ideas that have presented been presented over the course of the the seminar series so far uh, into your presentation, which I think. Well, I, I just have to thank you for a great series. I, I you know. Uh, Rather than giving a talk, I just stole the crap that I heard from you guys. I mean, half the stuff is from Yaakov's talk and his paper, half from, you know, just almost all of it is, comes from things that have, that have been in the series. So thank you for putting on a wonderful series. No, but it's, it's, it's really a beautiful, a, a beautiful thing. Um, so uh, thank you very, very much. Um, just a, a quick note um, to remind everyone that we'll be back here in two weeks um, for Philip Rocco's presentation. I hope to see many of you then. Uh, and, um, and just in closing, thank you again, Steve, for, um, for sharing this evening with us.